Okay, I think uh, I'm going to start. So, first of all, thank you, all of you, to, to be here. I know that at the same time there are different exciting uh, conferences. And actually, if I were you, I, I'm not sure that I would be listening to myself. Because the Amikumu thing is, is also pretty exciting, but still, you are here and I'm here. So, this is me and then the title. I'm originally from Barcelona. I work in Italy now, uh, and today I'm going to talk about linguistic justice in the cities. So, this is more or less the, the index of the session. I will present first what I understand by linguistic justice, why it is important to think about it in the context of the city. Then I will talk about something which is national, national monolingualism and its dangers, and then language justice from different perspectives, political philosophy, but also from, from others. So, okay, uh, this is a PDF, uh, it used to be a PowerPoint, and then I would ask you, who among you know who this guy is? And, okay, okay. That's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, last week I was in Amsterdam in, in a, doing a similar conference on experts on um, language policy and I asked the same question and only one person actually knew who this guy was, was Sabine Fiedler. So uh, this is Ramenhoff, the creator of the initiator of, of Esperanto and actually uh, every scholar in, in the field acknowledged that the, the beginning, the, the first people who actually had an interest into language rights and, and why this is important for justice is actually the Esperantists. So in 1887, the first grammar was created and in 1996, this uh, Praga Manifesto, it's kind of uh, the current ide ideology of, of the movement and if you, if you, you can find it in the internet easily. If you see, there are seven points, and most of them deal with uh, the need of plurilingualism, of language rights, language justice, so it's, it's quite connected. So the first advice to people who are actually interested in, in linguistic justice is just learn the basics of Esperanto, because it makes sense for historical reasons, but also because still some uh, scholars today uh, like to write these issues in, uh, in Esperanto. So there, there is, uh, if you want to be updated about the literature, it's important at least to be able to read it. It's not a coincidence that the speakers before myself, also this morning, we, we all are in, in, in this world, right? So, going to political philosophy, which is today probably, this is an in, interdisciplinary field of research, but uh, among the different traditions, political philosophy is the most interesting one, probably, the most promising. And from this perspective, linguistic justice is something normative. That means that we don't study how uh, language policy is done, but we, we think how should it be done, right? This is the normative aspect. This is why political theory or political philosophy play a role here. So how should a fair society be designed? And that's in general the issue about justice. So if we think about social justice or environmental justice, well, in the language dimension here is how should a fair society be designed in, in the language dimension, right? Now, if, if we study this from uh, a political philosophy perspective, from a normative perspective, then we need to have an ethical position ourselves. It's different if you are an economist and you are doing a statistical analysis. That's okay, that can be awesome. But here, you, you, you can do that, but uh, you also need to think how, uh, what does it mean to be good or to, me, to be fair? So, language justice, it can be, it can, can mean different things. So, for example, in, in the previous presentations, we've been, uh, we've seen that uh, language relationships in the European Union can be very unfair. 
this is a, a very important topic in the field to study how, for example, in the European Union or in the United Nations or in any other international organization, which should be the role of, of every language. This is one of the main contexts. A second one is also um, the relationship between native speakers today of English, English native speakers, and the rest of the world. I've written here an example in international journals. For example, every time I need to write an article for an international journal, then I need someone to translate it for me or to proofread it. Or, I mean, it, it's a lot of work compared with a native speaker. But you, you don't need to think just in terms of an international journal. Think about a presentation, like for example this one, and you probably, you've heard before Sean, and his English was excellent, and I, I was learning a lot, and he sounded much more intelligent than probably myself. Now, this is due to two reasons. One of them is because probably he is more intelligent, but also because he, he was more comfortable speaking in, in his language. So it doesn't matter if he's Sean or if it's someone else saying not very interesting things, but very well said, you always have the impression that, you know, uh, I'm not intelligent, as intelligent as the other people. This is the second context in which language justice or language injustice play a role. And the third one is if, if we consider uh, countries such as Spain and Belgium or Sweden, Quebec uh, and, and, and Canada, well, study how um, language policy should be in these countries to be fair. That's uh, a different context. What is interesting is that there is not a consensus in the literature about the solutions. So many people see that there are imbalances, disadvantages, and uh, injustice. But there are two main traditions. I've written here the, the two main act, uh, authors. Kim Lika, he's, uh, he's Canadian, and Van Parijs, he's, he's from Belgium. And the first one thinks that if we want to do democratic politics, that can only be done in your own language. So if you're an Italian or if you are an, a Slovak, you cannot basically think politically in English. It just it doesn't work. So you should do it in your language. On the contrary, there are other authors, for example, Van Parijk. He thinks that in order to be fair, everyone should be able to speak English at a good level. Uh, so it, it's basically kind of, uh, of the opposite of uh, what many people think. In his view, it's, it's already clear that uh, English is the lingua franca. So the solution to the injustice that he already sees, he also sees, is that we should actually foster the process. We should make it even more the fact that uh, more and more people uh, speak English. He wrote a book in 2011, which is uh, Language Justice for Europe and for the World, and this has become a turning point in the field after this, many and, and many scholars are writing PhDs about the issue, and most of them are actually criticizing him, saying why uh, the fact that everybody speaking English is not maybe the best option in terms of justice. Okay, so that was the first point, if you remember the, the contents of the session, linguistic justice. The second idea I want to emphasize today is that the city is actually an, an important place to do policy and to do language policy. Why? Because um, cities are becoming bigger and bigger cities are becoming bigger and are becoming more numerous. That means that more and more people live in big cities. The UN says that this is actually one of the most important challenges they have to deal with in the 21st century, and this is due to, in part, of the diversity of these cities. And if you compare a city with a country, usually cities tend to be more multilingual and more cosmopolitan than the country, right? This process is even fostered by migration and, and especially 
recently for many reasons. I've written here several, but uh, I like uh, this book. Uh, I don't remember the title. The title uh, Thomas Nell in 2015 is something like the figure of the of the migrant, or the migrant as the figure of our time, and uh, he shows that, uh, that the migrant is is someone which is everywhere and, and simply we cannot ignore him. And most of policies and most of authors, so far they ignore them. So when the UN is talking about the challenges of multilingual cities and sustainability, sustainability is, is linked to social integration, social cohesion, and I was thinking why then we don't think about uh, special language policies that take place in the cities. So that was the second point uh, I wanted to mention today. On, on the contrary, what happened is that we have national language policies, and the most typical national language policy is national monolingualism. That means that there is one official language because governments think that everyone is monolingual, so every country needs an official language, and they decide that a country will have an official language. I say here that this kind of language policy tend to misrepresent complex realities. The result of this policy is that there are winners and losers. So who are the winners? The winners are those who speak the, the language natively. And, but then there are other people who don't, are not natives in the language, they are losers and from this perspective. So there are many ingest, uh, injustices. But the situation can be much more complex, I said, as I said at the beginning. So what happens, for example, if in the same territory there are different language groups that claim that this is their land? What happens if in a, in a territory people live intermixed in a way that it's basically impossible to draw consistent borders around monolingual groups? Or imagine just people who are totally bilingual or culturally bilingual, it's very difficult for them to say I'm this or I'm that because they identify themselves with more than one group. This national monolingualism cannot help. So political, I oh know, before that, I say that this is important uh, beyond the, in, the injustice level, this is this is related to conflict, because if we don't manage adequately linguistic diversity, that creates discrimination, and discrimination helps or facilitates the appearance of political tensions. Now, if this was a PowerPoint, I would ask you how many of you know the history of the International Mother Language Day, the February 21st. So it has to do with the birth of um, Bangladesh. Basically, when Pakistan got the independence from India, they have to do uh, their official language because every country needs to have an official language, right? So they chose Urdu, Urdu language, as its sole official language. What happens was that in the same country, there were many other people who didn't speak this language. For example, those who spoke Bengali, from the moment that uh, their language was not official, they basically saw their socioeconomic opportunities reduced. They organized, they did demonstrations, and on February 21st, 1952, the government repressed brutally a massive march that basically connected the, the movement with uh, the, the idea of secession, and in the end, it uh, ended up with the birth of a new state, Bangladesh. And if you think that this is very far away from Europe, then I've written here some examples in Turkey, in Macedonia, in Georgia. But if you, if you think about it or if you read about it, there are many, many examples. So we've seen that national monolingualism doesn't work very well. Political philosophy helps us with uh, several principles. For example, with the principle of territoriality. That means that in a country, there are different official languages in different regions. One example is Switzerland, another example is Belgium. You see here, for example, in, in Belgium, 
if you are in Flanders, you basically need to speak Dutch. Um, if you are in Valon, you need to speak French. It's not that you can choose. The language of relationship between you and the administration is set, but at the same time, these entities are quite homogeneous, so that doesn't create a lot of problems. In, in, that creates a, uh, different problems, but not about this one. And in the left, you, you have uh, Switzerland, and you see the, the bigger pla uh, place where German is spoken, and then where French is spoken, right? Now, does it work? Well, this is definitely better. This is an improvement compared with national monolingualism. Imagine if these countries, the whole countries, had to choose just one official uh, language, and what about the others, right? The thing is that um, in cases that are more heterogeneous, that doesn't work. For these cases, political philosophy gives us another principle, which is the principle of personality. In this case, each citizen can choose the language of communication with the administration. For example, here we're talking about cities, so we can think about mixed cities with two different languages. Brussels, Barcelona, even in Amsterdam, to a certain extent, you can actually use English with the administration. And if here you have, uh, in the left side, uh, Brussels, in the, in, the, in the right side, you have uh, Barcelona, and because it's a very touristic city, you have also, in English, uh, yeah, this is uh, what happens, as in every touristic place. Okay, so we've seen the principle of territoriality, the principle of personality. What about immigrant groups? Someone was asking be before that. Well, actually, most of authors tend to exclude them as a political subject. Uh, but remember, that may lead to discrimination, and discrimination may lead to conflict. So it's important not to forget about them. Especially if Thomas Nell is true, and the, the migrant is becoming the political figure of our time. Okay, I said in the beginning that um, linguistic justice is an interdisciplinary approach. So far, we, I've talked about uh, political philosophy, but now I'm going to mention several other perspectives which are interesting. For example, legal scholars ask this kind of questions. Are language minorities recognized in the Constitution? So for them, the important thing is what is written in the legal documents. Other scholars make a list of the rights, but also the duties or the responsibilities that minorities, sometimes also majorities, are entitled to. Economists can ask, which are the costs and the benefits of a language policy? This way they can also identify which are the winners and the losers of a concrete policy and even think about possible compensations in order to reduce this injustice. Those experts in interlinguistics propose that uh, a language that is neutral can have a role in international communication. And also, sociolinguists, actually, they, they study to what extent languages are used or not. So, it, this perspective is, is very important because it's very informative. They actually say which languages are endangered uh, or more in danger, etc. My point is that uh, we should have all in consideration. So, the idea here I, I propose that uh, apart from the two principles that we've seen, territoriality and personality, there is another one which is called subsidiarity. And those who are, those of you who are familiar with the European Union framework, probably that uh, sounds familiar to you. Basically, from a language policy perspective, the original principle of subsidiarity says that everything that can be done through the local language should be done this way and not in another more global, global one. So it's like setting limits to the different language. So each language is used in a specific context. If we think about the idea of an international auxiliary language, that also um, includes an element of subsidiarity, because uh, 
The idea is that this language should be used only internationally to allow communication among people with different mother tongues. So in, in these two examples, each language is used in a specific context. In each of, of the two, a particular sphere is linked with a particular language. In the first case, the local one. In the second one, the international one. Now, my proposal is to expand this idea in order to apply to basically any other dimension of life, family, religion, politics, anything that we can think of in which language uh, plays a role. And I'm going to finish with two examples of this uh, idea applied to politics. Example A happened in May 2015. It was um, elections in Barcelona, in the municipality, so this is the local electoral campaign. And one of the political parties stated as one of their aims that they wanted to foster active citizen participation. So in order to achieve that, they used materials in the electoral campaign written in the 13 main um, immigrant languages present in the city, and they also used Esperanto. And probably it's a coincidence, but uh, they won. So this is actually our mayor in Barcelona. Now, why, why I think this is an interesting example? Because, um, well, it, it's quite extraordinary. I, I, I don't know if you are used to see this kind of uh, electoral materials in many languages in, in your countries. So this way, most of the residents in Barcelona could participate politically in their own language, which you may think that that helped their individual self-esteem, their dignity, fairness. Does it actually go against effectiveness in communication? No, uh, everyone speaking Catalan and Spanish also found tones of information of the electoral campaign. And you can also think that this may help to reduce uh, intercultural conflicts in, in a non-violent manner. So this was the first example. And the second one happened in... Uh, okay, not yet. No, yes. Second one happened in Berlin last year also the electoral campaign. And in these elections, there was this, this party, the Link, who said that they wanted to increase the participation of non-German residents. And in order to do so, they used materials in 10 languages. So similar to what happens in the case of Barcelona, most of the people living in Berlin, including the migrants, were able to participate politically in their own language. Just a, a, a parenthesis, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, um, electoral or regulations. You know, um, for example, Europeans, we can actually vote in, if me, that I'm from Barcelona, I live in Italy, I can vote in the municipal election in Florence, I can vote to the European elections, but I cannot vote to the national in, in Italy, right? So, in Berlin, they used the 10 different languages. One of them was Catalan. Um, and, and in this case, I, I tried to do the research a bit further. So I contacted the people responsible of making this decision and I interviewed them, one of them. And it's interesting because one of the things that uh, this person told me was that they wanted, that they, they thought that addressing the migrants in their own language helps to personalize the election for them. And this basically reminded me the idea of the principle of personality. And of course, they do not intend to apply this language policy to any election. And that's the idea of subsidiarity. And the guy said, only when, where it makes sense. It would be of limited use producing translations for general elections where you can only vote if you have a German passport. For European and local elections, everyone with a European passport is qualified to vote, which is where it makes sense to translate this information. And that leads to the conclusion. So here, basically, I wanted to stress that 
We may think about more ambitious language policies if we take into consideration that the city can be a crucial arena of policy making, that the migrant can be a political subject, and that uh, linguistic justice should be approached from an interdisciplinary perspective. And it, it's interesting because this idea, you remember Kimlika, he was saying um, politics should be done in the vernacular. With the corollary of this idea, what normally is understood is that it should be done in the local language, in your language, but basically in one language. And here we've seen that you can actually do politics in the vernacular while expanding uh, multilingual policies. So this way, you can argue that you have more linguistic justice, that politics are more democratic, and normally the argument for having just one language, that it's efficiency, I don't see how we reduce efficiency in this case. Now, if you have questions, I'm, I'm, I'm finished, thanks. Yeah, Sean. Uh, just to say thanks very much for a very interesting lecture uh, indeed and your English is excellent, I say that as a native speaker. Um, but uh, I was particularly struck by the point you, you made about the use of um, uh, Esperanto as one of the 13 languages in Barcelona in the, uh, the local elections. I, uh, one of the speakers at the previous session mentioned uh, the fact that uh, immigrants are, are left out and, and I, I think it's a, it's a very, very wise decision to include Esperanto because of the fact that it's uh, about 10 times easier than, than English or French to learn and uh, it, it has, I would think, a greater chance of uh, giving in immigrants uh, politically equality, the fact that they uh, could learn, if they're learning English or French, a lot of them would be behind native speakers in these languages, uh, whereas then, if um, they were to, to look at Esperanto, they can make much more progress much more quickly uh, to gain a level of fluency. And, and, and uh, in this way, I think uh, Barcelona is very progressive in, in including, uh, first of all, in, in, in doing material in 13 languages to include all the main immigrant communities, but secondly, in including Esperanto as well in, in this area. Okay, so I answer. Yeah, actually that is the reason why they did it. It's not that the whole political party is, is very supportive of Esperanto, but among the group of people responsible of doing this policy related with migration was one Esperantist, and he proposed the idea, and no one said anything against it, so they, they supported it. And, yeah, um, yeah, I also think it's a, it's a good idea. Moltes gràcies. Uh, puc parlar català? Sí. I uh, pot ser tu pots uh, traduir després. Um, parlant de la de la idea que les polítics uh, parlen uh, en, en la llengua regional, um, havia llegit un uh, un article fa 15 anys, pot ser sobre la política eh, noruega. I eh, deia que a Noruega el nenorsk i el bukmal són llengües eh, com, un poc com l'esperanto dels dialectes de, de Noruega i que és molt sentit eh, per la gent eh, parlar el dialecte i els polítics eh, parlen normalment en els dialectes de Noruega. 
cadascú en el seu, en el, en el directe de la, de la seva regió. Era solo, tan solo un, un comentari, no sé si sabies aquesta cosa, si, si, si t'agrada comentar sobre aquesta cosa. Gràcies. So, um, the question was, uh, was a comment uh, about um, language policy in, in Norway, which I'm not uh, an expert about it, but uh, I do know that there are two different languages, two different Norwegians, and um, the person who asked said that uh, one of them is a kind of Esperanto or, or the different Scandinavian um, languages. And, and he said that he read an article many years ago saying that uh, politicians there actually like to speak in their own language or even in their own dialect. It's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I said before that I'm, I like very much the idea of interdisciplinarity, but uh, it's very challenging. So. When, when, for example, me or other political scientists, we talk with people that are social linguists, they ask you, okay, and then what is a language? And what is a dialect? And uh, of course, the, the, the answer to that is, is probably, um, it's political, right? So, um, yeah. Um, from my perspective, what, what uh, theoretically the ideas that I that I put forward um, doesn't matter what the population in a particular country consider if it's a, a dialect or if it's a country. Um, just taking the example of Barcelona or Berlin, if in Norway there are different ways of saying things, and you can call it a dialect or um, a language and there are easy ways to make people feel comfortable in their own way of, of saying them, in, 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 the, in the two ways, for example, I think it should be done this way. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. This topic really interests me because I'm, I'm from Galiza. And uh, because I was brought up bilingually in that part of Spain, and you showed us the cases of Switzerland and Belgium as uh, successful situations where different languages coexist in a nation or in a country. We could probably mention also Finland. Why do you think, because in my opinion in Spain it hasn't really been that successful. I've always felt a bit like not discriminated, sometimes maybe positively, sometimes negatively, for, for coming from Galicia and being brought up bilingual. What do you think in Spain the model of plurilingualism doesn't really work as well as in other countries? Okay, I, I will repeat the question for the, for the video, or? It's okay. So, the difference between Spain and Switzerland is that uh, in, in Switzerland, if you are in a place where it's German speaking, it's normally it's only German speaking. If it's French speaking, it's only French speaking. So you, it's true that in Switzerland people speak many languages, but if you are in the principle of ter territoriality is very strict there. So if you are in a, in a canton in which you have to relate to the administration in German, it's only German. So this has advantages uh, and disadvantages. In, in the Spanish case, as, as you know well, in Galicia, um, the, the two languages are, are official. And many people have the impression that uh, one of the two is more official than the other. So, I mean, we, we could talk longer about it. I think that has to do with also psychological region, reasons. Many people, what we were saying about the difference between dialect and, and language, and I also mentioned self-esteem. I think there are many people who think that uh, still today in, in Spain, languages that are not Spanish, uh, 
are not as important or should be used to a lower level. They are not, um, they, they, they are not useful for, for politics. So it's, um, there are uh, different things involved. But from the perspective of this presentation, basically the um, political um, principle which is uh, behind the policy is, is different than in Switzerland. Thank you um, very much for your presentation. I'm curious, as I'm from the United States, and obviously our model uh, is very monolingual and very different from the European model, even though we have a lot of speakers of different languages there. Um, and I'm curious if, you know, the examples you gave were also very European, we're in Europe right now, but I'm curious if you've seen anything that you can kind of expand on successes that might have come from um, anything that's happened in, in the United States. What, in my experience, voting there, um, we do have translations of things in other languages um, for, for different minority groups in the area, but one of the major, um, uh, one of the major ways in which people say that we shouldn't do that has to do with the practicality and the cost and obviously in the United States we don't have the same uh, general perspective on social welfare as, my, as is taken here in Europe, but um, that cost is, is a major argument against. And I'm curious, is what might be different in the European model that is making this more possible? Is it more successful? Is it easier to promote um, this multilingualism and inclusiveness in the electoral processes here um, despite that argument for cost that maybe we can try and learn to adapt in the United States even though we have a different viewpoint. Thanks for the question. Actually, the, the case of the U.S. Is, is very, very interesting for many reasons. You know, for example, I think that the number of uh, Spanish speakers in the U.S. is actually higher than the number of Spanish speakers in Spain. The U.S. is also interesting, I think, uh, different from what, what I've said before. In the U.S. there is not a, a legal document that states that, that, that states that says that in the United States as a whole there is an official language. So everybody assumes that it's English but it's not written anywhere at the federal level. In different states that's different. And actually, there is a very interesting uh, dissertation on linguistic justice just presented some months ago by a Catalan researcher. And she analyzes empirically many, many countries. And she found that the US, even if it's theoretically very liberal, in practice, uh, it's, it's not that liberal. So th there are different states in which uh, more and more legislation is being passed uh, that prevents, for example, to um, teach some courses in, in Spanish, even in neighborhoods where the majority, or in cities where the majority of people is Spanish-speaking. I think one difference that um, challenges that the uh, United States and other countries um, of the English-speaking world has in relation, or different from Europe, is the fact that uh, you guys speak English and um, there is this belief that um, everyone speaks English in the world, which is totally false, but uh, people still believe it. And um, it's interesting now, I'm, I'm one of the research that I'm, I'm doing, I'm asking people just in general, um, we're, we're doing this in the south of Spain, but I am totally sure that it works everywhere. We're asking people, how, um, how many people you think, what is the percentage of people that in, in a country, in Europe, speak English? And we compare that with reality. And it's, it's uh, a, big, a big bias. So people think that it's much, much more. So in, in the United States, 
if they think that they already speak the language that everyone else speaks, it's kind of, of difficult to, to understand the importance of translation. So it's, it's not a problem only of the United States, it's also a problem of the UK that um, foreign languages are not actually studied uh, at the school. These are countries that, uh, where people normally don't speak other languages. And um, in Europe, normally people have to learn English, some of them, they, they do it to a certain extent. And, and probably this also makes them uh, aware of the importance of learning other languages. So they, people who learn English sometimes they try to also learn another one, and, and that, I think that creates a... But I mean, it, it's everything. Think about that we are now in Bratislava, and if we move uh, half an hour, and we are in another country, if we move half an hour, we are in another country, they speak different languages there. It's, it's kind of, of, of difficult. And uh, this question that, that you ask sometimes is, is a question that Esperanto speakers ask themselves in the US, they say, how can we actually make a understand to the other people around us of the importance of Esperanto when they don't see all these different languages around? Because here it's kind of uh, natural. The, you easily find yourself uh, speaking with people that has other languages as a mother tongue than yourself. But if you are from the States or from Canada, and it's, it's a whole continent that uh, understands you or should understood and understand you, and uh, that has positive things, but uh, from a multilingualism perspective, that's a challenge. And thank you uh, all for listening and coming.